James chapter number three, and we are continuing a series here on bearing spiritual fruit. And we started here in this, this series of bearing spiritual fruit on looking and focusing in on the root system, making sure that we pay attention to the parts that are the most vital to, to our, our, our producing fruit at all. And that is looking at the root system. So we've looked at being rooted in Christ first, making sure that we are saved, making sure that we are rooted in Him. We looked at being rooted in His Word, spending time talking about uh, being rooted in that which is the words of God. We look here at being rooted, or we looked previously at being rooted in truth, Pay attention, paying attention to what the truth was, and making sure that it is our foundation upon which we build everything else. And of course, thy word is truth. And what is his word? Capital W, it is Jesus Christ. And you see how it all works together. Jesus Christ, the word of God. Uh, you have also uh, the truth, because he is the truth. Uh, he is the way, he is the life. And now this evening, we are going to begin looking at being rooted in Christ's wisdom. So if you're keeping notes, being rooted in Christ's wisdom. Wisdom is a valuable commodity. We've talked about it much in the past, but it is a priceless commodity. You cannot buy or purchase wisdom with money. Uh, You cannot buy or purchase wisdom with goods. There's nothing you can trade for wisdom except possibly maybe time, learning. But there's not much you can trade for godly wisdom except for your love to the Lord and your time in His Word and your um, submissiveness to the Holy Spirit. So here we look at being rooted in Christ's wisdom. You're in James chapter number 3. We're going to begin reading in verse number 13 to the end of the chapter. James 3, 13 says this, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. This ending section here of chapter number three, dealing with earthly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom. Every day we're faced with situations that we likely have not faced before. As you grow older, you get get more experienced. You face situations, you know, similar situations to what you faced before. But as you get older, so does your responsibility increase. And as your responsibilities increase, you face situations you've not had to face before. And we need wisdom to make these decisions that we've never made before. And so as we look at this focus on becoming rooted, deeply rooted in Christ, we want to learn how to handle those situations, asking ourselves, How would Christ handle this situation? Not just tritely saying, what would Jesus do, like they did back in the 90s. But asking, I can't just go with the flow. I can't just do what's natural. I can't just follow my gut feelings or follow my heart. Because in the past, I've tried that, and it's brought very poor fruit production. Just following my heart? Just following my gut feeling? Going with the flow? Doing what's natural? But what is God's perspective on these decisions? What is God's perspective on these difficult times we may face? The areas when we need wisdom. Well, previously we've learned that if we're not rooted properly, then we're not going to have the right fruit. Despite our best efforts to produce fruit, it begins at the roots. We know this. And so we have to ask this question. Where would rootedness in Christ lead me in this decision? So as you face a hard decision, 
Sometimes you have to ask yourself, if I was right with God, what, would, what decision would I make here? You know, if, if I were producing, you know, on all eight cylinders, the fruits of the Spirit, what decision would I make here? If Christ were living in me, now, ultimately, we know we have the Holy Spirit living in us. But we are supposed to be submitted also to the point that Christ's words and actions are what are coming through us as well. And this is Christ living in us. What would Christ do in this situation? What would the fruit of rootedness look like in this situation if I were properly rooted? Well, Colossians 2.8 reminds us, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There is philosophy that would choose to believe what is deceptive. There's a philosophy that follows the world and man's traditions. We have to watch out for the world's philosophy and for the world's wisdom. You see, here's one of the differences between finding God's wisdom and the world's wisdom. World's wisdom is constantly shouting out at you. It's constantly bombarding you. Worldly wisdom is constantly coming across the internet and the television and the radio and on the billboards and the advertisements, constantly bombarding you with the world's wisdom. And it's always through your own fleshly desires. What are your fleshly desires? Well, we know what those are. You know what your fleshly desires are. What about God's wisdom? God's wisdom isn't constantly shouting at us. God's wisdom is just waiting for us. Now, the Bible does say that wisdom crieth out in the streets. It's not difficult to find. But the Bible says in James 1, 5, and two chapters before this, that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He's got plenty to give. He's not going to make fun of you for needing it. And he's going to give it. So let's look at the contrast here between what the world's wisdom produces and what God's wisdom produces. Number one, and this is where we're going to focus this evening, is the demonstration of godly wisdom. In other words, how is godly wisdom worked out? How do you recognize it being demonstrated in somebody's life? The demonstration of godly wisdom. Wisdom isn't merely spoken. A man can get up and he can say all kinds of wise things. But if you watch that person's life and you don't see much wisdom being demonstrated in there, you're probably not going to listen to much of what they have to say. I've noticed this even in my own life. There's certain people that, you know, in the past have tried to give advice over this, over that. And there was this inclination in me to some folks to not want to accept their advice. I don't want to listen to it. I don't even want to bother taking the time to hear it. I'm not interested in their advice. And, and then I would stop and think, well, why? Why does it bother me so much to hear their advice? Is it because it's you know, good godly advice and that's rubbing me, I get my pride wrong? Or is it a pride issue? Maybe sometimes it's this issue that I didn't have much respect for them, that I didn't see in their life the product of godly wisdom. And so I didn't value their wisdom very much. That's not to say that the, what they were saying wasn't right, because it very well may have been right. And it may have been valuable wisdom. What about us? Are we demonstrating the fruit that this wisdom, that godly wisdom produces? Number one, it shows in our works. How do we demonstrate it? It shows in our works. Verse number 13 here asks a question, and then it answers the question for us. How nice of them to do that. It says, who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? And here's a question. It's like, okay, he's looking out at a crowd. Is there anybody in here that would think of yourself as a wise person and dude with knowledge? You're fairly wise. You have a, a good deal of knowledge. And of course, I, I wouldn't imagine too many people would raise their hand and say, oh, yep, that's me, you know. Although I've met some people I think might raise their hand and say, yep, that's me. Um, uh, I don't think any of you might do that. But he asked the question, anybody like that? Okay, if you view yourself as being wise, if you view yourself as being one to give advice, as, as being given much knowledge, what is his advice? Let him, that person, show, show what? Show their wisdom, their knowledge, how? out of a good conversation 
his works with meekness of wisdom. Let him show it. Let him show it. Talk is cheap. Let's see what your wisdom can accomplish. Look back at verse number one of this chapter. In verse number one of this chapter, it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. This term master here means teacher, or one who has the ability to teach and give encouragement and knowledge. Verse 13 describes a godly master. He's endued with knowledge. He lives that knowledge out with wisdom. Some people say, um, those who can do, those who can't teach. I remember hearing that a lot. You know, when I was teaching, I'm like, well, thanks. Why don't you just smack me in the face? <laughs> you know, uh, go ahead and do it the other cheek while you're at it. I remember hearing a guy one time tell me, I've never met anybody from your Bible college that was sold out for the Lord. And I thought, well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to leave your house now. <laughs> I'm not interested in finishing dinner with you and your family now. Uh, that was rude. Um, whether or not you think I am or not still. Uh, but what is a, 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 this godly teacher? The godly teacher is somebody who's, who is endued with knowledge, yes, but then they live out that knowledge with wisdom, with meek wisdom. There are many men in the Bible who are wise, who had great knowledge. Of course, we think of Solomon, but we also think of Daniel. Daniel is a, a, a good study in the Old Testament about this knowledge and wisdom. He was a godly prophet. He had revelation given to him to give to the king of Babylon. And so he gave this revelation of the king's dream to the king. And in Daniel 2.28, he makes sure to point this out. Daniel could have very easily taken that wisdom that was given to him by God that didn't come to him naturally and taken the credit for it. But Daniel 2.28, he's sure to mention this to the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. How did I get this information about your dream? There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Back in the early days of the church of Jerusalem, the church, leader, the church leadership that found that they needed helpers in order to serve. And in this search for helpers, for servants, we call them deacons, they were searching out godly men who were wise. That was a mandatory prerequisite for, for who they were to find to be a deacon. It wasn't to be someone who was powerful. It wasn't to be someone who was financially sound, per se. Uh, what was the, 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 one of the pre -re 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 prerequisites? And I'm struggling with that word tonight. Pre <laughs> I'm going to stop saying it. <laughs> Requirement. There we go. <laughs> what was one of the requirements? For one of these men. They had to be wise, search out wise. Now we know in Timothy, in 1 Timothy, uh, there is a, a list given of requirements or qualifications for deacons as well, but they were to search out godly, wise men. Doesn't talk about, you know, um, how many businesses they run or if they're a CEO or uh, how many, you know, letters or abbreviations come after their name or anything like that. Godly, wise men, and they can come in all shapes, forms, sizes, languages, colors, backgrounds, jobs, but godly, wise men. And how will you know godly, wise men? Well, look at Acts 6. Well, you don't have to look there. I'm going to read it. Acts 6, 3, it says this. Wherefore, brethren, look yet among you seven men of honest report. What does that mean, of honest report? It talks about their reputation. In other words... You wa you've watched and you've seen how they've lived over the years as they've been a part of the church, how their families have lived as over the years, and you've seen their reputation, and they have an honest report. They're not known for double dealing. They're not known for being hypocritical. They're not known for being all smiles at church, but you know all anger at home. There's not those kinds of issues or anything going on at home. These are men that are of honest report. They are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, it says who we may appoint over this business. Daniel's wisdom was recognized by King Nebuchadnezzar, but it wasn't recognized by his saying that he was wise. Daniel didn't get up and say, hey, you know what? I'm a pretty wise person. I'm pretty knowledgeable. Why doesn't somebody ask me? Ask me, ask me. That's not how they recognized Daniel's wisdom. It was seen through his works. It was seen by how he behaved. It's not enough that we just, okay, I'm saved. And, you know, men can sometimes be this way. I'm saved. 
and I, you know, I read my Bible, I go to church, I do the right things, but don't expect any more from me. Don't expect me to be kind. Don't expect me to be open to people. Don't expect any of those things from me. I've got this part down. You know, I'm good and right between me and God, and don't expect much else from me. God expects more than that. He expects that godly wisdom that comes from studying and learning the Word of God and spending time with God. He expects that godly wisdom to be worked out on the outside, and we'll see later how it is manifested. They were to be chosen because others could see wisdom through their works, the deacons were. The word conversation there in verse number 13 of chapter 3 it says, let him show out of a good conversation his works. This conversation isn't just words, you know. We, we understand the idea of words being cheap. Anybody can stand and, and talk a good game. Armchair quarterbacking, you know, like that. And uh, you can sit and watch a football game and get frustrated about the quarterback. Man, he keeps making stupid moves. Why does he do that? Why didn't he hit that guy over there? Why didn't he throw it to that guy? Why didn't he run? And from our angle where we're looking down at the field, you know, like God, we can see all the routes he could have gone. We can see the guy that's chasing him down from behind that he couldn't see. And we, of course, could with that 2020 vision and with all of the replays make a better decision than he could in the heat of that moment. But when you stand down there on the field in that position, and you've got these hulking walls of guys, you know, standing all around you and the noise and the lights and the, the chaos. It can be a whole lot more difficult to jump out there and make that catch or to kick it just right or uh, to see the, the cornerback and not hit him instead of the wide receiver. It's a whole lot different when you're there. Conversation is cheap. And this term in verse number 13 about conversation is not talking about talk. It's talking about our walk. It's our lifestyle, the way we live. It's what demonstrates our faith and wisdom to others. How will others see godly wisdom in you? Not by your prayers in church. Not by even sometimes, not even through the preaching itself. Because uh, you know, even an ungodly person can get up and say some good stuff. But it's by the way you live on a daily basis. The true test of wisdom is working it out daily in our lives. That's where we see the fruit. It's in our conversation. In, verse, or in Philippians 1.27, there's this verse that says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. That's why as Christians, we have to be extremely careful to not let ourselves be hypocritical. And that when we're around other Christians, we behave one way. But when we're not, our jokes our language, topics of conversation, things change. It needs to be one. Our conversation be as it becometh, like it is adorning, like it is accessorizing the gospel of Christ. If I were to bring you a wonderful meal that was cooked and prepared by my wife, and it was steaming hot, smelled amazing, and anybody's mouth watering, I'm not going to tell you what kind of food it is, but it is amazing. Best thing you've ever had in your life. And I were to take that wonderful dish of food that, that was going to be so amazing, and I were to put it inside the silver platter that's been polished nicely. And I were to deliver it to you in that silver platter with a little garnish, with a napkin, with a, a glass of sweet tea or lemonade or both, and then sit it down in front of you at the table and you lift that lid off. Mm, it is becoming you know, the meal, the garnish. Everything, the table setting, it becomes that food. And it can make even bad food look good. But then if I were to take that same food and I were to go and grab a box out of my garage that has a few cobwebs and maybe a few uh, spiders in it, and probably a few diapers in it too, the not, not clean ones. And, and I were to stick that plate of food down inside that box and use the diapers to give it a nice you know, place to rest on so it doesn't jiggle around in the car while I'm driving. And then I were to come and I were to hand that box to you and, oh, there was some good, sweet-smelling food coming out of there. There was some not-so-good-smelling stuff out of the diapers coming out of there too. Is it, is it adorning the food very well? Is it becoming the dish that I'm trying to present to you, the gift that I'm trying to give you? Well, the obvious answer is no. I'm, I'm going to the extreme here. I'm using hyperbole to help us to understand when we bear the gospel of Christ in us, and we try to take it and we try to deliver it to our family, or we try to deliver it to our neighbors who hear everything else we do and say and see how we behave. 
And we take that gospel and we deliver in the package that is us. Is it full of diapers, <laughs> nasty ones? Or is it a fine silver platter? You see, our conversation adorns the gospel. He says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, in our society, we regularly see examples of people who are talking about wisdom. Videos, podcasts, um, articles, everything written about wisdom from all various angles and aspects. We see lots of examples of people talking about wisdom. When you see somebody who's trying to talk to you about financial success, what's one of the first things you want to do? Let me go find out if this person is financially successful. That's a good place to go, right? If this person is trying to teach you about, well, let's say if they're trying to teach you about being in the ministry. One of the things that I would want to know is, has this person been in the ministry? If they haven't been in the ministry, then there's only going to be really so much that they have to offer me. If you're going to go to law school or if you're going to go to med school, you're going to look at the source or the institution and the professors and teachers that you have. Have they practiced? Have they made big mistakes? How are other graduates coming out of the school doing? And you're going to want to go and you're going to find out those things because you want to see if their works back up their words. They could talk a good game on how good their education is going to be. But you want to know where are the men and, and, and gals who are graduated from that college, where are they going into the ministry and how are they doing now? James 1.22 reminds us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. When we are not living according to the wisdom of Christ, it doesn't matter what we say. If we're not living according to the wisdom of Christ, people are going to laugh at us when we try to present the word of God to them because it's going to be in such a contradiction to how we consistently live our lives. Now, I implore you of this. You go to your language and the things that you're saying, and, and I want you to pay very close attention to the things that you're saying. Sometimes, you know, there are things that we need to avoid saying. You know, there's certain you know, racial jokes and slurs and terms that we need to avoid saying. And we need to just, just drop those things all together. There's certain words which are borderline curse words. You know, we don't let our kids even, you know, say the borderline curse words or the borderline, borderline curse words. Or the replacement curse words. Uh, because I don't want them to work their way towards anything at all. And I don't want there to be any question as to what it is they're saying. And so we draw a line of what we allow our kids to say, of what do we allow ourselves to say. Because I don't want anything in my conversation or their conversation to detract from our ability to be witnesses for Christ. You can't in one breath make fun of people because of their skin color or use derogatory slurs about them and in the next breath attempt to witness to somebody and then not be seen as hypocritical. It doesn't work that way. You can't be cursing in one breath and in the next breath be saying praise the Lord without people saying, seeing, man, that's, that's hypocritical. And so we have to watch very carefully our language for that reason alone if for nothing else so that it does not hinder our testimony. And not just our testimony, but the testimony of the church that people know we belong to. And not just that, but also to the Savior that people know we belong to. It needs to be shown in our works. Number two, it needs to be shown in our spirit. In our spirit. Look again at chapter 3, verse number 13, where he says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works, and look at the last part of the verse. Show his works with meekness of wisdom. You know, our works alone don't just indicate Christ's wisdom. Because we can do, force ourselves to do the right things. We can make ourselves read the Bible. We can make ourselves hand out tracts. We can make ourselves show up to church and mow grass or, or whatever the case is. We can make ourselves do the right things. We can show up for our Sunday school class to teach. We can make ourselves do the right things, but not do it in the right spirit. Our works alone don't indicate Christ's wisdom. And you know, children see that too in the home. 
It's one thing to say, mom and dad took me to church every Sunday. And then when they turn 18, still not want nothing to do with it. And it's another thing to say, mom and dad took me to church every Sunday. But their religion wasn't just a Sunday thing. It was an everyday thing. It was real to them. It wasn't just religion. If it's just religion to you, then it's going to be even less than religion to your children. If it's real to you, the kids are going to see that not in your works only, but also in your spirit. Think about this. We're affected by the things that we take in. I remember teaching, um, uh, there was a, a sermon uh, that I preached back in Florida, you know, concerning music and how music is not all moral, all moral meaning without morality. Uh, that music, you know, as, a, as an avenue, as an art form, is not all moral. We can't look at painting and say that painting is all moral uh, because you can paint some bad things. Um, we can't look at photography and say that photography is all moral. We can't look at music and say that music is all moral either. We're affected by the things that we take in. I remember reading a study about certain kinds of, you know, um, popular music that you know, one of the things that they like to do is emphasize the wrong beats. You know, they emphasize maybe two and four. When you emphasize, if it's a four-beat song, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, naturally, our heart beats to that one, two, three, four, and that's the natural place that we want to put the emphasis. When we switch that to one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, now we're dancing, you know, uh, things start to change a little bit. Uh, and it's been scientifically shown that when you are um, incorrectly placing the beats on the wrong um, time, it can cause something inside your head that is called switching. This is where it actually makes it difficult for you to cognitively think and understand things. As a young person, if you sit there and you try to study your science textbook, you know, listen to some acid rock, it's not going to work out very well for you. You're going to have, it's going to be very difficult to concentrate on your work. Uh, your brain is switching. It's, it's, it's cognitively making you more diff, uh, making it more difficult for you to understand. There's dissonance within you. We may, with a very peaceful and happy spirit, walk into a store in the mall, and if that store in the mall is pumping out loud music, it's going to affect us. Have you ever sat at a restaurant and realized that uh, you were chewing in time with the music? <laughs> I catch myself doing that all the time. And you ever notice how the music in the restaurant is different during, you know, according to the time of day? At lunch, the rush hour, that music is going, man. It's fast because they want people in, out, chew quick, swallow quick, get out the door because we need the space. But dinner time, when things aren't so busy, the music's a little more laid back. They want you to hang out. Hey, why don't you have a dessert while you're at it as well? You know, uh, we want you to relax and the music definitely affects you. Now, um, I know I'm, you know, more musically, I don't want to say musically inclined. I appreciate music more than maybe some other people do. Maybe I don't. I notice it more. It has a, it has a physical effect on me. And, you know, whether it be happiness or depression or calmness, music has a big effect. You know, I might have, I, I almost cried when Colton was born. But, you know, not much else is going to bring me to tears. But music, I can't watch Hallmark movies because they're sad, most of them. And then there's the sad music and the sadness with the sad music, and I don't stand a chance, so I just won't watch them. Music, you know, it, ha it has a physical effect on me is what I'm trying to say. And that loud pumping music, it's, it's going to change us. If the music is angry, it's going to sway our spirits. We'll become discontent. We'll become unsettled. If the music is rebellious, it'll sway us towards combativeness. Why is it that so many teenagers are so combative, so angry? Maybe because their music is. In the same way, if we're taking in God's wisdom, it's going to affect our spirits. Maybe the hymns aren't quite as appealing as the world's music. And that's one reason why we don't want to let our children get an appetite for the world's music because then they won't appreciate the hymns anymore. You know, the world's music, the rock music, it's, it's kind of like the triple, you know, or death by chocolate cake, I think is what I think of it as. <laughs> death by chocolate cake. There's just so much in there. It's not good for you. 
and it takes away your desire for good stuff. If I had to choose between celery and death by chocolate cake, hymns might be celery, you know, uh, but I, I might want to choose death by chocolate cake there. I'm not saying hymns are dry or boring or anything like that because I don't think they are. I think the focus of the hymn is on the melody and upon um, complementary uh, lyrics, which are meant to deliver a message. Half of the world's songs, I haven't a slightest what they're saying. Unless I, I, I read a printout of the words, I wouldn't have any clue. In fact, there's some songs that the joke is that people still don't know what they're saying in, half, in some of the songs from like the 70s and 80s. But if the music is rebellious, it will affect us. God's word sways our spirit. It sways our spirits towards meekness, humility. Those are the signs of a wise man or woman. How do we identify somebody who is seeking wisdom? And when I say that, I'm not, I'm not trying to get us to start looking around with magnifying glasses at each other. We need to point the magnifying glasses at ourselves. So when I ask this question, how do we identify someone? You need to, in your mind, ask this question. Do I see these? Do I recognize these in my life? What are some indicators? We seek wisdom from above, recognizing we can't do it on our own. Do you seek, do you, do you pray and talk to God? Lord, I don't understand what's going on in this situation. I don't know how to move forward. Now I can go and I can ask other pastors and I can go and I can ask other godly men and women. But do I seek wisdom from above? Recognizing that I can't handle it on my own. Do we seek godly counsel? In Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14, it says where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Are you willing to admit failure? There's a hard one. Men. Do you, and women, do you realize you're an imperfect sinner? Do you realize that you are saved solely by the grace of God? Do you recognize you're not perfect? Do you admit your mistakes, your sins, and your failures? That could be a tough thing to do as a parent to your child because we make mistakes, right? Sometimes we fly off the handle for something we shouldn't have flown off the handle for, or sometimes we make an assumption. We assumed they said something and start to punish them for a thing we thought they said or did. In reality, they did not. And sometimes we have to say, I'm sorry, or sometimes we're just mean. <laughs> we're humans too, right? We're just mean, and we have to apologize. Do you see that ability, <laughs> maybe even readiness, to apologize in your own life? Romans 12.3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, realistically, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What about this? Do you defer credit to others rather than seeking to give credit to yourself? I know it's natural for us, for us want to divert blame to others, right? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't say that. It was my wife, right? Or uh, I didn't do that. I sometimes shout that, you know, I dropped something on me, you know, uh, and it was clearly me. I'm not trying to get away with it, but do you, but it, it's natural for us to want to divert blame, but it's also natural for us to want to keep the credit, even if it's not ours to keep. And the fact is, there's not a whole lot we can credit ourselves for. Oh, but that was your idea. And, but you worked so hard on that project. Praise the Lord that he gave me that idea. Praise the Lord that he gave me the talent to work on this project, that he put me in the right place to learn how to do this and around the right people to be able to do it the right way. Praise the Lord. He gave me clarity of thought, you know, in this particular instance. Praise the Lord for that. Who gets the credit? It ought not to be us. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why didst thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. In other words, what makes you different from anybody else? What, did you, what, what do you have right now that you didn't receive? In other words, that wasn't given to you. What talent do you have that you earned and was not given to you? Well, I can tell you, you know, I can play the violin you know, rather mediocrely, but that wasn't earned. Well, sure, I did put time in practicing. I, I fought it more than I practiced, I think. <laughs> I, I was not a very pleasant you know, child when it came to uh, violin lessons and piano lessons and trumpet lessons. Um, I didn't want it. 
Uh, I was forced to keep doing it all up through high school, and then I chose to keep doing it in college and was thankful that my mom did not give in to my many, many temper tantrums throughout the years uh, to want to stop violin. But that's not my talent. No matter how much work and effort I put into it, God gave that ability. He gave me the parents he did. He gave me the teachers that he did. He gave me the instruments that he did. That wasn't me. I can't credit myself for that. Who do we give glory to? Here's another one. We give glory for our successes, our victories, and our accomplishments to God. I used to struggle as a young person when I would go and play my violin in church. I always wanted to sneak right out afterwards and grab my violin and sneak out and go hide in the car because it drove me nuts. All the people coming and saying, great job, Nathan. It sounded wonderful. Good job. It was so beautiful and, and all that stuff. It drove me nuts as a kid. Um, I, I didn't want to say praise the Lord. It embarrassed me to say that. But I also didn't want to say thank you. It's, I know, I'm so wonderful, I'm so great. Um, I don't know if it was pride, a mixture of, of, of pride, but who ought to get the glory? Hey, pastor, you know, that was a great sermon, said, said nobody ever, right? But hey, who gets the glory for that? God should get the glory, not me. It wasn't, it wasn't my sermon. It was the Holy Spirit working in your heart. It was, it was you being sensitive to the Holy Spirit this time as opposed to all the other times, right? We need to give glory for our successes and our victories and our accomplishments to God. It, it wasn't because of the award-winning cologne that I was wearing the day I met my wife. No, it was God that sent her my way and used my ex-girlfriend to do it. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians one thirty one: He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I have nothing to glory of. Oh, I managed to comb my hair and fix myself up and drag myself here this evening. Maybe I look half decent, but I have nothing to glory of. I would not be here today if it were not for the Lord. Who knows where I would be, rotting in some jail cell today. Maybe I would have already killed myself by this point. If, if God had not offered the way of salvation to me, had He not placed me where He had, if He had not given me that eternal free gift of salvation, who knows where I would be today? Or it's some job working for myself or sitting on a couch watching a football game. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I have nothing to glory of. Do you see these aspects in your life? You see, with godly wisdom, it needs to be seen in our works. We can't just hide it inside. It needs to be observable. It needs to be evidenced in our lives, through our works, but also in our spirit. Maybe it's a natural tendency to have this spiky exterior where nothing affects us and nothing bothers us. Nothing gets to us, and, and I, that's a temptation of my own, is to not um, show emotion or allow emotion to have the better part of me or anything like that, and to have this... Uh, you know, rough, spiky exterior that keeps people away, maybe. But my spirit needs to be not that of poor me or stay away from me. My spirit needs to be not that of don't bother me. But also my spirit needs to not be that one, one that is, you know, woe is me, feel sorry for me because everything's going horrible and I wear my emotions on my sleeves and I want everybody to know and feel bad for me. And No, our spirit needs to be that of meekness. It needs to be godly. A person who possesses godly wisdom is pretty easily recognized. Because godly wisdom dem demonstrates itself in our works, and it demonstrates itself in our spirit. And so back again to verse number 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? And everybody takes their fingers and they point at their chest and they say, who, me? Well, if you want it to be you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Show it forth with good works, in the right spirit, in meekness of wisdom. Well, look at me. I brought five people to church. Everybody should be proud of me and pat me on the back. Hey, bring people to church, but do it in meekness. 
Well, look at me. I reached out and I helped this person overcome something. Or look at me. I reached out and I helped this person memorize or help this person to learn these doctrines. No, no, no. Help, yes. Reach out, encourage, help teach. Wonderful, wonderful. But do it in meekness of spirit. Giving God all the glory and not yourself. That's how we are supposed to do it. But godly wisdom, while we look at it, and we value, value it highly, not everybody does. And so next week, we're going to look at the devaluation of godly wisdom.